after both USC and UCLA lost their bowl games last year, I was begging and pleading both schools to embrace sanity, to play defense, and only one of the schools has. So tonight, we're gonna break down how UCLA embraced sanity, glorious sanity, by embracing defense. Hi, I'm James the Faithful Angelino Sports with tonight's October 20th edition of Friday Night Chalk Talk, where we break down the keys and goals for each of LA's football teams during the regular season and playoffs. All four teams are going to play this weekend. Now, to be clear, I believe USC is playing a more important game. I believe the Rams are playing a more important game. Definitely more than the 25th ranked Bruins, but I truly believe the UCLA defense is one of the most important stories in the Pac-12 conference, and nobody's bothered to break it down yet. Nobody. Now, to be clear, I honestly believe the Bruins are going to pick up a road win in Stanford this weekend. The fewest amount of points the Cardinal defense have allowed in a game is 21. You can be impressed by the fact that they beat Colorado last weekend, but Stanford still allowed 43 points, and the Buffaloes just don't play any defense at all. The question is, can the Cardinal offense keep pace against the Bruins' defense? The answer is no. And unlike a lot of people out there, I want to actually explain why. I took the liberty of watching three UCLA football games this week on the DVR. Uh, Fox Sports color analyst last week, Spencer Tillman, he was praising uh, defensive coordinator Anton Lynn for bringing an NFL scheme to the college game. And now the offense has to adjust. He's completely wrong. He is absolutely wrong. What Lynn is doing is not cooking up these crazy off, uh, defensive schemes to try to outfox the offense. He is simply letting four very talented and very physical defensive linemen set the tempo. And the rest of the team just plays a loose zone. The Bruins rarely blitz. They don't have to. They don't. Not with Leatu Leitu as one end or Gabriel Murphy at the other. Not with tackles Jay Toya and Gary Smith. They are, those four are penetrating the opposing backfield virtually without ever needing help. They do it on their own. And that means the quarterback has to complete a pass with seven guys playing back in his own defense. Now, what does it matter? We talked a few weeks ago about how USC blitzes at all times, right? When you blitz... Sounds exciting, sounds amazing, but if you blitz somewhere, you open up a spot on the defense. Say this linebacker blitz for SC, you have an opening right here to exploit. That's where the phrase hot route comes from. You're simply audibleizing to a receiver that you want them to exploit the hole where the blitz is coming from. It's what makes Tom Brady a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. He knew where you were blitzing, right? You want to know why the Patriots lost twice to the New York Giants, even though everybody would take Brady over Eli Manning? It's because the Giants had four down linemen on defense who could pressure Brady without blitzing. Brady's back there, he's seeing four guys come at him and he has nowhere to throw because there's seven people kicking back in the, in, on, in the backfield. Look at what you can do as a defensive coordinator when you don't have to send a fifth man, when you don't have to send a fifth and a sixth man. You can play an extremely loose zone. That's not a bad thing. Loose zone doesn't mean you're back there twiddling your thumbs bored. It basically means you get to read where the play is going and just make a smart decision in terms of where you're going to react. Loose zone means you have five potential receivers going up against seven people past the line of scrimmage. That is, a, that is a numerical advantage for UCLA. And remember, I mentioned a few moments ago, UCLA establishes pressure with the front four. So what do you do? Well, most offensive coaches are gonna keep a running back back to pick up the blitz. So instead of five receivers going up against seven defenders, you're now talking four against seven defenders. Absolutely remarkable. Because UCLA does get the pressure. I'm not just saying it just to say it. Leitu had 10 and a half sacks last year. So far this year, five and a half. Craziness. Absolutely effective. 
So what UCLA will do is keep it simple. They'll run cover three. They'll take either, they'll have either three safeties in the back or they'll take one cornerback, send him back here to play a nice loose zone to prevent against the deep ball. The three linebackers, because UCLA plays a 4-3, three, three linebackers and one defensive back will slice this part into fourths. You have a linebacker here and a quarterbacker and a cornerback simply playing routes that go into the flats. And if anybody tries a short route like a hook or a curl, you have a linebacker right there to take, take advantage. Nice and easy. And by the way, UCLA's linebackers are right up there, too, in terms of ability. Middle linebacker Darius Massau leads the team with 32 tackles. Weak side linebacker Febe Oladeju made 91 tackles last year for Cal before he transferred to Westwood. He also, by the way, had 17 tackles against the Bruins. Somebody took note. Another time, another place. Point being, great rush, sure certain tacklers right here making everything nice and easy for the rest of the defense. The Bruins, by the way, will also have a tendency, they'll bring a safety up to play on obvious rushing downs, make it a 4-4 front. Now, it's not a perfect defense. No defense is, right? You could say, look at this middle layer and confuse them. How? Well, you could run crossing routes. Who takes this guy? Who takes that guy, right? Or... You can even say, you know what? We are going to attack the safeties by sending two people deep against one safety. But here's the problem with that. Those plays take time. Do you have enough time to keep these four guys from coming up and smashing you into the turf? UCLA has been effective at getting to the quarterback before that deep play develops, before an intricate passing route develops. I'm a fan of simplicity. I really am. The Bruins rarely blitz. They rarely stunt. The coaching staff knows for a fact that Leitu and Murphy are two legitimate NFL prospects. Leitu in the first couple of rounds. Murphy seen as a third day pick. Why complicate things? Why complicate it? Get to the quarterback without risk. Here's something ironic, by the way, before we change teams. An opposing Pac-12 coach described the Bruins and said, if UCLA keeps building their team in the manner that they do, they're going to be every bit as physical as Stanford used to be. So there's that. 18th ranked USC is hosting 14th ranked Utah. Despite getting clobbered in South Bend, the Trojans are still in a position to win the Pac-12. With If you win the Pac-12 with just one loss, despite how ugly the Trojans looked in South Bend, you're actually in the discussion for the college football playoffs. So this is actually must win for both the Utes and the Trojans. But the Utes have a problem. And they've had that problem all year. There are too many variables. They have been at home for most of the year, for one. They played on the road at Baylor. They won that game, but Baylor isn't ranked. They lost to Oregon State in Carvallis. They got hammered in Carvallis, actually. So I can't say for certain that the Utes are a good road team. And for that matter, we have zero idea if quarterback Cameron Rising is going to play. I don't believe the guy's played a single snap this year, as a matter of fact, because he blasted out his knee in the Rose Bowl. And the Utes have been zipped, zipped, just shutting their mouth every single week. Oh, maybe he'll play. Maybe he won't. He was supposed to play against UCLA a few weeks ago. Totally didn't happen. <sighs> and if you recall, while it is true that Utah beat the daylights out of the Trojans in the Pac-12 title game in Vegas, and I would know, I was at that game, Utah needed a miraculous fourth quarter rally to beat the Trojans in Salt Lake City last year. The key to this game is if the USC defense can staunch the Utah running game as a result. I don't think freshman Nate Johnson or Bryson Barnes, the reserve quarterbacks for the Utes, I don't think they can go throw for throw with Caleb Williams. 
Utah does have two running backs that they like in Jaquindon Jackson and Jalen Glover. Jackson, for example, he averages five and a half yards a carry. But Williams becomes the second key to the game. First key is can USC stop the run? The second is Williams has to know exactly where every play is going and to get the ball out like that. Because the one thing that the Utes defense does is they do apply pressure. They're arguably the most physical team in the Pac-12. USC clearly got punched in the mouth last week by a very physical Notre Dame. And opposing coaches said before the season that you could still out-muscle them. So USC actually has to muscle up this week. If they do muscle up, they're probably going to win by more than seven points, maybe two scores. Not closer game. I acknowledge I'm a USC fan, but my belief is that the Utes' lack of road success plus instability at quarterback is enough of an advantage for USC this week. I dropped the note on Thursday, switching to the NFL. JT Watt of the Steelers has eight sacks so far this year. Eight. Moreover, the Rams, will, who will host the Steelers this week, have another issue. Kyron Williams earned his starting role. He earned his starting role not because he was this elite running back, but because he made a priority last offseason in learning how to pick up the blitz. The offensive lineman loved that guy for that. But Williams is out for more than just a week with an ankle issue. That is the main problem the Rams have to solve because Pittsburgh can get to the quarterback, but if the pass gets away, the Steelers don't get to Stafford and Stafford completes the pass, the Steelers have been exploited to more than 12 yards per completion. In other words, complete a pass, get a first down, straight and simple. If Matthew Stafford is upright, there is no way in hell he is going to get outplayed by Kenny Pickett. None. I don't know if anyone can explain how quarterback ratings are put together, but what I can tell you is Pickett is the 32nd rated quarterback in the NFL. In other words, butt naked last among regular starters. I can also tell you that the Steelers average fewer than 16 points a game. 16. Now, I'm not predicting a blowout. The Rams don't have the personnel for blowouts. But cross-country flights are also a bona fide pain in the rear. Pittsburgh is doing that. Flying across country, road game, don't have the quarterback to match up, and they get exploited on pass defense. I see a Rams win. Meanwhile, I think the Chargers are going to lose to the Chiefs. Straight and simple. And I'm not trying to say that to poke fun at the Bolts. I have dear friends who are Chargers fans. My wife is a Chargers fan. I am super happy when I don't have to sleep on the couch. Moreover, I would dearly love to not see Taylor Swift on my TV. I have had it. I mean to the point of wanting to vomit with Taylor Swift on every screen while I'm watching the NFL. I don't care. I've, I've had it. To, I've had it. So I would love to tell you that I envision a way for the Chargers to win. I'd love to tell you that, but I can't. Only if Patrick Mahomes gets hurt, but my loathing of that thirst trap chick with Travis Kelsey does not mean I want Patrick Mahomes to get hurt. And I don't see him getting hurt. The Chiefs have a good offensive line. So in sum, I believe UCLA is going to beat Stanford red handily. I think USC can beat the Utes, but it'll be difficult. I think the Rams will definitely handle the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I think the Chargers are losing in Kansas City. If you enjoy talking football with me tonight, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We're talking about all four teams virtually every single day here. Thank you for watching. I'm James. We'll be back tomorrow. Faithful Angelinos is a Kian Corte El Queso production. Take care.